Chris Coughlin, it's about time we had this conversation, isn't it? It is. It is. It's been a long time, but uh, yeah, glad to finally get around to it. How are you doing, lad? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Long day, but no, all, all good. Uh, and yeah, no, just uh, happy to finally get sat down to chat with you because I think we, we were just saying, weren't we? Like, yeah, we you know, when, when we worked together and I chatted to the cars come home about jobs, about football and that. So, no, it's, it's uh, good to get it recorded. Oh, definitely. And I mean, I should preface this conversation by saying you are certainly one of my mentors within the sports media space and my career thus far. Um, you've taught me a lot of what I know about radio production in particular. Um, and I have a hell of a lot of respect for you and, and your body of work. And as I say, I am I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. As I also mentioned off air before we jumped onto this, I am freestyling because I've got no written notes. Um, I have been awfully busy. Um, and I, I, I there's obviously there's a, a lot of questions I feel like I could sort of open this up with. Uh, and one of the ones I feel like putting forward to you is is the Liverpool squad of nineteen twenty the best Liverpool squad of your lifetime? And if so, does that by default make it the best Liverpool squad of all time? That's a great question. I think given what it achieved, I think you have arguably got to say so. I mean, obviously, I've seen a lot of great Liverpool squads over my lifetime. I think the one that you could kind of compare it to was the one just beforehand in 1819, just because that team got to 97 points and also won the Champions League as opposed to the squad of 1920. Um getting to 99 not points winning the Premier League but losing in the round of 16 in the Champions League so I think I think it's a very interesting debate when you put it like that I mean both showed remarkable consistency I think rather than pinpointing a single season I think that that squad of that kind of year or so that two three years I, I, I think that is absolutely what, what you've got to look at I think there are other squads that were very good but didn't achieve anything. I look at 2008-9. Um, I think that was a very good squad. But I think it just lacked the cutting edge at times. I remember between January and February of that year, um, there were a lot of draws against Wigan, against Everton. I remember there was a draw at Stoke as well, and nil-nil. I think Gerard hit the post in the last minute. Um, well, ultimately, that team didn't achieve anything despite the fact it was enjoyable to watch. But ultimately, from around 2018 to 2020 and obviously the, the season afterwards as well, the season or two afterwards as well, there was success to put next to the name. So regarding is it the best Liverpool squad of all time, I think you just have to ask different people, different generations about that. Yeah. Uh, of course, I hear a lot about the, the 5-0 against Nottingham Forest in the 80s and what a lot of people describe that as the most complete football performance by a team that they've ever seen. Um, and obviously I, you know, I've seen bits of that game. I haven't seen the game in full, but that Liverpool squad of the eighties as well was was an incredible squad. So I think it's very difficult to kind of say he would get into this team, he would get into this team. I think you can look at you know, naming um, like a, an eleven if you like, but it's a funny one um, in terms of saying what the best Liverpool team of all time is. But yeah, um, it, it, it's it's got to be up there that period from 2018-2020, absolutely. Yeah, I would caveat what you say about the 18-19 squad in that although it did win the Champions League, I don't think it was the best team in Europe. I think Barcelona probably were the strongest team in Europe at that time. Obviously, you pulled off an incredible night at Anfield where you turned that tie around um, in the semi-final. But in, te in terms of just the dominance and almost rising to the occasion and blowing every other team out the water. Um, uh, I would say that that 19th side at that time was the best team in Europe as well as being the champions of England. So I, I would probably go along that lines. And, and what you say about the uh, the squad from the 80s, um, even, you know, uh, Liverpool, almost similar to Everton are a side where you can file through the eras and you can pick out standout players that would, you know, sort of stand the, stand the test of time and are still talked about today. Dark Leash, Rush, Ray Clements, 
you know, all, all these fantastic, wonderful players, Emily Hughes. Um, but <laughs> a mate once said to me, I think we were having a discussion about um, about Everton's team from the 1980s. And whilst we were kind of taking the, the debate seriously, he, he had a sort of a, a moment of realisation where he says, just said, stop being silly. If you put a team today against any team from the 1980s, they put five past them, just purely based on the, the physicality and the, the athleticism and the developments within the game from that time. It'd be interesting to see the squads from nowadays on the pitches back then. <laughs> I think just because you know, we are we are used to carpets these days, aren't we? Um, but I totally get what you mean because ultimately, like fitness levels are through the roof. Um, I remember when I was learning about football growing up because um, I, you know, you, you know me, I, you know, I'm a kind of a football rounder. If you like, I just love to take so much in about the game. I remember watching a documentary about years gone by and uh, Bobby Moore. Um, there was an advert he did for pubs and it was like uh, lo- looking at the local um, and, you know, players, uh, they'd say after matches, you know, it was a lot more lenient thing back then. Um, you know, I think they, you know, have a bit more alcohol, maybe things like that. Um, I mean, you get people like James Milner these days, Declan Rice even, they, they just don't touch it now. Um, or certainly a lot less than they did um, because of the different standards. These days as well, um, I think it'd be very interesting to see because uh, you could compare maybe like a George Best kind of thing to like Lionel Messi, for, for example, just because I think George Best, when I think back, like Grinch as well, they're more the, the twinkle toes of, of those kind of eras. Whereas Messi, you know, he, for me, just stands above, above the rest um, in that regard these days. But back then, the twinkle toes, it was a bit. You didn't see too many. I mean, I suppose you could look at John Barnes in terms of Liverpool be, being like that, in terms of uh, what, one of the all-time great wingers for, for Liverpool. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it was ever possible, Craig, yeah, I wouldn't mind staying around another thousand years, however long it took to be able to create a simulation to see that. That would be that would be something brilliant. Interestingly that you, you bring up George Best in that, because it just brought me back to a, a conversation that I had with Colin Waldron, formerly of Burnley, Chelsea, uh, Played for a couple of clubs in the states as well. Played against some fantastic players, particularly when he went, when he went to the states. Played against the likes of um, uh, Cruyff and Beckenbauer and, and players, just you know, complete legends of the game. And he was steadfast in the opinion that George Best was the uh, the best football player of all time. And one of his arguments was that Lionel Messi couldn't head the ball. <laughs> And then obviously did he watch the two thousand eight championship? Did he watch two thousand no, nine, two thousand nine, and home famous two thousand nine Champions League final. The boot, <laughs> the boot falls off and he runs off kissing the boot. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But it it is it's interesting. But at the same at the same time, you bring up the differences in lifestyles. Uh, maybe it's the Evertonian in me. I don't know, but I can't help but feel like we missed out on a special era of football. As in, we live in an era now where you know. We cannot complain about it because ultimately we are professionals within the space today. It's the sport that we fell in love with and we've come to adapt and get used to what football is now. It is a lot different to what it was. I would even go as far as to say when I was growing up through the early 2000s, um, but particularly from that space between you know 60s through to 80s, where it was a particularly working class sport where the connection between fans and players was was like complete unity where you go as far as to say you'd see players in the pub after games enjoying and socializing with fans is there a part of you as professional that you are today that wishes you would have been around then to almost have a crack at sports media back then it's really interesting you mentioned that because i mean my my granddad's got some incredible stories um he, he tells me some amazing stories and one of them um, he said he, he used to get on the bus when when he was growing up, and sometimes he just pop on and just see Billy Little, <laughs> just just on the bus, just chilling. Um, but we, oh, I've I've talked to some incredible journalists down the years. One of them, um, John Keith, has been around the, the Liverpool area for for years, um, and he said years gone by he will just rock up to the gates of Melwoods to, to Everton's training ground as well and just have a chat with 
uh, just have a chat with Shankly, Paisley, Kendall, you know, all, all, all these amazing names. And we are different in that now. Um, I think sometimes, you know, it, it, it is great sometimes when you see your know, players maybe give their shirt and, and things like that. Um, I understand maybe security reasons why they can't sometimes get out their cars, you know, when like, you see kids, like you want to take photographs of them and stuff like that. Um, I, I know what you mean, but at the same time, I think we see, um, you know, footballers nowadays. I was reading James Milner's uh, ball biography, um, great read. And he said, when, unless it's like he's literally in the middle of a, a meal, taking a bite out of his food, he will stop and, and, and acknowledge people that say, you know, I can have a quick picture or, or anything like that. And I think, you know, we have got a lot of good people around these days. Um, I think, I know what you mean in terms of saying, having a crack at media back then. I mean, for example, I think Clive tells he summed up really well last week with the sad passing of, of John Motson and that, the reason why people call him the voice of football is because he was the voice of football. Whereas nowadays, yeah, we have got incredible commentators of the last 20 years or so. Martin Tyler, Peter Drury, Clive Tilsley himself. You know, the, the, the list goes on. Guy Mowbray, Steve Wilson, the, the, the list goes on. But because it's so saturated in those regards now, you know, we, we know those great names. But a lot of people watching the TV maybe might know the names, but might not know the people. But back then, because Motti was the voice, that's it, it, it's quite beautiful in that regard. So it, it was a lot less saturated back then. So probably, yeah, I, I, I get what you mean. Uh, but I think see, social media takes a big side of that now. Um, and look, I think we're also learning things about social media. Um, like, <laughs> I just see uh, what, what I, like a lot, I like a lot about what content producers do. Because I can't get my head around TikTok. I've tried to make a few different videos with filters and that. It's an absolute pain. But I would like to get me a hang of it, a hang of it eventually. Um, but yeah, I think a lot more focused back then, I think, on one singular thing. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I love I love the business as it is now. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. Would, would, have been, would have been worth a crack. Yeah. And, and I guess what I think a, an interesting talking point for the for the two of us to discuss is that we are and it it, it does make me laugh when people refer to it because they're, they're not wrong we are still ultimately around the start of our journeys within sports media when it feels like we've been doing it for bloody ages it's like <laughs> like the, the environment and the, the obviously the the rapid development of the technology and, and social media as you mentioned that we've almost grew up alongside Whilst, you know, a lot is made of the fact that it can be detrimental, you know, for, for multi, a multitude of, for, you know, mental health. And, and yeah, as that, that point perfectly that you just made in terms of saturation. And in, in there's just so many voices um, that it is also a tool that can be used for the good and to be used to benefit us. And, and, and you know, not only as an individual, but in terms of collective, in terms of, of brand marketing and, and organisations and, and in, in in our sort of world in terms of news outlets pushing their agenda with breaking news and, and things like that. So, I did you go to UCLan? I've never actually asked you much about your time at UCLan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, sports journalism at the University of Central Lancashire. Yeah. yeah. Between 2014 and 2017. Yeah. Right. So, how, how did you find dealing with the evolving monster that is social media during your time as a student at uni? It was interesting um, because back then as well, um, I, I kind of learned during it about the, obviously the, the professional versus the uh, personal side of social media. Uh, I don't have, like for example, on Twitter, I've only got one Twitter account, but you know, Twitter's a place just for, for football opinions for me, maybe the odd picture of my dog in terms of just joining them with the odd hashtag or something like that. Um, but I don't know what you mean because I mean, I I, I had some incredible lecturers at uh, UCLan, uh, Jerry Byrne, Steve Canavan, um, fantastic lecturers. And I think it was Steve in the second year or so, uh, Charlie Lambert, Colin Griffith as well, incredible lecturers. And they said about 
kind of aiming for a certain amount of followers, uh, maybe by the time they left uni, things like that. Um, it, it's one of my, I, I, I didn't really, or I haven't, haven't hit that number. Uh, I mean, I, I see people with X amount of followers, and don't get me wrong, I probably would like a couple of thousand more followers and, and things, but, um, you know, it, it, it's what kind of, what you can almost give to them as well, and to be honest. And, I, you know, I, I enjoy working on social media, um, but I think sometimes I see people, you know, posting a lot, and I, I've got no problem with that whatsoever. But I'm like, I, I like watching stuff, but it, it's how I react to it because sometimes you just feel like you're talking to yourself. I'm sure, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think a lot of people are the same. Are you? You're tweeting, 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 and not getting a reply. I'm like, yeah. am I literally just talking to myself here? Yeah. Um, but I, I think I, I think I heard someone describe Twitter as like you're talking to yourself and you get the odd reply now and then, um, which which is fair. Um, but then you know it's how you react to say if you say something and someone disagrees with you or things like that. It's how you conduct yourself online as well, um, because ultimately social media is a public profile. Um, it, I think you know. We can put something like you know view, uh, view, like views of my own. I, I think that that's something we put. So obviously, any tweets you do, effectively, you're saying that they, they represent you, yeah. and that, that that's why it's so important to say um, say things in the right manner, word things correctly, um, give your view as as it's intended. Obviously, sometimes like sarcasm can't be told over social media, and that and that's sometimes one thing. Even like over texting, sometimes you get a message from your mate, and you're like, "Is that sarcasm?" Um, but that's that's certainly one way to go about it in terms of I, I I like to go about I like to go about social media how I go about in that I wouldn't say anything untoward I wouldn't say anything you know I, I wouldn't say in, in work uh, that's that's something I think is important as well because you have to convey yourself in, in, in social media so um, I think TikTok as well. I know I mentioned it earlier, but like that really caught the wave in COVID, didn't it? And that was one of them that kind of used it more for watching videos as opposed to actually contributing in videos. But I see some brilliant people. I think Joe Joe Tomlinson in particular, his 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 football content is is fantastic on on TikTok. Um, and I probably I would like to learn how to use it to be honest with you because I would like to learn how to at least kind of give my opinions on 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 those kind of things even if it's in video form. Um, so it is evolving all the time, and I've still got a lot to learn on it. I think we've all got a lot to learn on social media. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's it's been interesting to to watch it go along. Yeah, definitely. And I would say I, I think you you've made several brilliant points in terms of. Uh, the individual and how you sort of portray yourself and conduct yourself in terms of, you know, all views of my own and et cetera. One of the things that I find fascinating about working in the industry that we do um, for the, the companies that we do in particular is when it comes to handling social media on behalf of a huge news organization, um, which I think if you are to, deconstruct the skill set uh, you know it, it's essentially copywriting with a, a mode of address a, a tone of voice a specific audience that you tail tail content to um i would argue the both of us having worked for bbc radio merseyside working for the bbc is is really interesting and almost the aspect of it being radio merseyside as well um, and obviously maybe that is just quite a selfish thing to say given that we've grown up in the area but it does just make it that extra bit more spe- special in particular. Um, and from a BBC standpoint, the fact that it is more matter of fact as opposed to opinion and conjecture. Um, and I would argue, I'm not saying it's a bad thing because I enjoy it and I wouldn't pursue it otherwise, but there's, a, an ad, there's a pressure that comes with that that I think people wanting to get into the industry don't quite fully understand. Um, people yeah. People need to understand when they are, it's essentially PR and communications on behalf of, you know, a, a huge organization. It could be, you know, any news outlet that there's a responsibility that comes with that. Um, so I, I, I guess in terms of a question to put forward is how have you find found adapting to, to 
communicating on the behalf of, of organizations such as the BBC? One of the things that kind of came to my mind as, as you were kind of coming to that question was one of the big things, one of the big values that work for a company like BBC um, and this is actually one of the, the um, qualities of the BBC or one of the values is that you could see a bit of news breaking out um, especially if it's, if it's hard breaking news a serious story and it's better to be late and correct than early and wrong and that is <laughs> that is so true um, because for example like, you know, you see, I think we see a lot of stories for example in the transfer window when this play is like this play is like this play is like this play is like and more often than not I mean how many times do you see a club linked to maybe 50 players in a transfer window and maybe about five of them have any sort of legitimate connection in terms of actually happening I was going to say I thought you were going to come to a, a Chelsea conclusion there I'm waiting for them to bid for me <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't be too far down the line um, but it really is important in terms of just buying it you know if a, if a big story is breaking get your sources because I, I think where you know, we look for certainly club source for example like say um, legend passes away for example um, I'm thinking Ro- Roger Hunt for example Ian St John um, very, very important that before we go with that story on social media, yes, other people might have, have broken it, um, but we look for club verification before going for um, before before going with the story. Uh, but at the same time, it's about organizing guests, uh, organizing content in the likelihood that it is going to happen because certainly if you see someone that was close to um, a, a, a sporting legend and they and they send out that message, whilst the club might not have said anything, clearly if someone's that close to someone that, that, that they're posting that message, it must mean something. So you go about it in your own way whilst being respectful, um, gathering the content, just preparing, um, preparing it as well because I think... There's been a few stories there with Ray Ray Clemens as well. You know, I've I've, I've worked at Radio the Major side during a lot of you know quite a few legendary players that have passed away, um, and it's just about going about it in the right, right way. And it, it, it's never a nice story to cover, but it kind of teaches you the way to conduct your business as well. And then look on on the sporty side of things. Look, sport news is you know, we 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 know how to um, break stories about transfers, things like that. You know, I think one thing's important in that you know we don't particularly post on uh, speculation. Um, if, if if there's an educated story from you know a well reliable source, we might well. Comment on it. For example, we got um, Adam Pope from BBC Radio Leeds. He was on a couple of weeks ago to talk about the links from Marcelo Bielsa to Everton, and if that would have happened, because th- there was no, you know, it was a fact that Bielsa was at least being thought of by Everton, as opposed to being speculation about him. Um, and we read obviously <laughs> interesting stories to why that that uh, that ultimately didn't happen. Um, but those who comment on speculation will at least chase down that have a fundamental value to them as well, um, which is important. And I, I, I enjoy working for the BBC because I enjoy working with facts as well. And that that's, that's something I, I, I really do enjoy. It. Yeah, I, I'd certainly echo that in that one of the, the downsides I find to social and digital media is, again, I know we referred to it earlier and you think, I think you're right to, to point it out as one of the, the key things is is transfer speculation and rumours uh, and the transfer mill as as you said. I mean, God, God, God bless my granddad because uh, he he is he is brilliant. He might well listen to this, but um, my granddad will he'll, he'll send he sends me the, uh, the the football gossip every day without fail, 
And you know, it it just you know, I love it. It was a semi grand, a nice little message back, but it's one of them where I just have a quick glance to you, but I'm like, it's you know, who, who knows, who knows what's real in here and what isn't. But I, I we 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 both know, we both know our trusted journalists. I've I've been fortunate enough to meet some brilliant journalists at press conferences as well. So we know we know who to and that. But at the same time, when you're glancing through these stories, you don't know what to make of it sometimes. So, yeah, God, God bless my granddad on that front. Uh, no, 100%. I guess it, that, that's the thing. It, it is, in whole, it's, that is what I was once told during uni, that out of all of the web pages under bbc.co.uk or bbc.com or whatever it is, the the web page that gets the most views is the Transfer Rumours um, page, which in comparison to, like, breaking news and whatever just just speaks to the the not necessarily the importance but the attention that that does attract um which I, again there's, there's nothing you can do to to solve that is there's nothing you can do to change it, it the, the beast is what it is and i guess it, you you know you're either you either specialize or focus on transfer rumors and speculation or you you do more matter of fact stuff as you say that in terms of what the bbc focus on one of the things i wanted to to highlight Currently, Chris, at the moment, which I am, I'm very happy to to speak to you about. Is I've noticed you've started getting a few more presenting shifts in terms of like rugby. Now, one of my biggest ignorances, and I'll go as strong as to say ignorances, is whilst I do have a strong appreciation and respect for a variety of different sports, I understand people dedicate their lives to sports where you know there are skill sets that people master. There, are, as we say, there's the there's broadcasters and people who work in the media of that sport that perfect copyright in, in, in that sport's language and terminology with, you know, a complete and almost poetic at times understanding of how the sport is played and how to convey that through, through a medium, whether that be writing, whether that be through, through, you know, photographers and picture, whether that be through, through video and, and radio and the, and the spoken word, or how do you find, or, do you have any experiences to call on which has helped your flexibility and adaptability in terms of moving from rugby and football to rugby in particular? Because I, I, I will say I've found growing up in this part of the world that football is just your bread and butter, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, growing up, look, football is what I would call my bread and butter just because I, I watch it pretty much every day, I'd say. Um and I, you know, I remember growing up when my mum was like almost kicking off and about to be on the TV. But now she enjoys it. I've I've, I've worked it, I've worked it into her. She she's uh, she enjoys it. Um, but I think because when I went to uni, I, as you say, uh, you clan, I went with the intention of being a sports journalist. And don't get me wrong, that was more than likely always going to entail football. But I enjoy other sports as well so I was always willing to to, to branch out into others um, for example I know you mentioned rugby there I, I love my darts I love my darts um, I've been incredibly fortunate to interview Michael Smith um, I've chatted to Johnny Clayton as well Wayne Mardell um, you know some some big names big names in um, in, in the world of darts um, and it, it, that is something where it kind of, that, that, that came through uni when when the Premier League returned to Liverpool last year, uh, I was backstage in the, with the media at the MS Bank Arena, and uh, had a brief chat with Gary Anderson. And Gary Anderson was the first when when I started probably getting to darts. Gary Anderson was the first world champion that I watched back in 2016. You could call me a glory hunter in that regard, but I've always therefore held a little bit of a, a soft spot for for Gary Anderson. So just even to meet him briefly was was amazing. And obviously, the, the, you get a developing of darts. Um, the more and more you watch it, um, tennis as well. Um, I, I do, I do very much enjoy tennis. But yeah, going going back to rugby, as you mentioned, um, aside from football on Radio Mersey side, it, it's the biggest sport that we cover, rugby league as well. And I think I know what you mean in that you could say maybe it's because Liverpool itself hasn't had a dedicated rugby league team, for example. Um, I know that was looked into a while back, and Omar One Kukash um, looked at that potentially becoming uh, becoming reality. But ultimately, 
you know, we, we we cover a lot dedicated rugby league show on on Wednesdays on on Radio Merseyside, and weirdly I'm enjoying it because it, it's increasing my experience as well. I've had experience of, of bulletins over the last few years as well, um, and it, it's something as it's something that I've kind of felt. <laughs> Felt like you know, you learn about on the job as well. You know you can shadow and everything like that, but you truly learn. You truly learn when you're live and that red, or the the red lights on, and you can see it and you know you're live and you learn in those moments. I mean, even on um, even on Sunday, and I had to laugh at this. It was half twelve in the afternoon. I introduced. I had my script in front of me. Hello and welcome to Radio Mosad Sport. Good afternoon, all that kind of stuff. And I started with good evening. <laughs> That's all right. Just carry on. Just carry on. And then I even said afterwards, it's a bit early for evening, isn't it? Good afternoon. And then I, when I went to my presenters, uh, or my, my, my commentators, Matt Newsom and James Gordon, I said good evening again. But Matt was brilliant because he bailed me out. Because it was the week after Saints won the World Cup Challenge. And he said, you're still on Australian time, aren't you? I was like, I really am. Thanks for bailing me out, Matt, I thought. Um, but honestly, I think... Why? I I I found myself easy into or I found myself capable rather easy is the wrong word. I found myself capable to kind of throw myself into different sports as as well because because of my love of football and I see how much it affects people up and down the country and just how much it means and I just see how much sport means to different people. Like, say, for example, I was on the train home today and I just I saw there was a story about um, Southend United that tapped on the link and it, they, they paid off the, the monies to HMRC. Um, and obviously, they've been in a lot of trouble, Southend United. But that that put a smile on my face because the amount of people down Southend that will care about that football club, that will have had seen some great days. I remember them beating Man United back in the 2000s. You know, for, you know, Sport means something to someone everywhere, and I think that that's why it helps me enjoy sport more, knowing that it makes people happy. And I, I think that that's that's ultimately one of the cruxes of why I feel like I can adapt to sport is because sport makes people happy, and that's why it's so incredibly important. Very well said. Very well said. I I, I enjoyed you saying, it. and I guess. Oh, thank you. No, I think you hit the nail on the head. And I guess in terms of when you're on the mic and, and when you're presenting, especially given the platform that we have, you do feel a responsibility to portray that, especially, I know we were talking earlier about you know the different voices of football. We're, we're not on the same pedestal as your Mark mm-hmm. Tyler's, your Clive Tilsley. Oh, no. The Drury's. But in our own worlds, when we have a microphone and when we have an obligation to talk about sport, as I say, I, I think you do feel that responsibility of what sport means to people. And I guess a, a key skill set in presenting is relaying that enthusiasm, re- enthusiasm and relaying that passion. Yeah, my, my, my worst fear would be, say, for example, going into a live interview and not being prepared or asking something that is 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 wrong or not not being aware of a certain information before yeah. uh, an interview you know, about an interviewer uh, interviewee rather um just because I, I i pride myself on on being informed i pride myself on you know making sure that i put in the work um because i, I think Whilst I think we we'd be confident enough, say for example, talking to, I don't know, we even throw out a name here like, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi. Yeah, you know, we 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 could sit there and talk about loads of stuff, but there'll still be stuff that we don't know. So it's about you know just thinking and, and preparing properly, um, because it, it's down to trust as well. In that you know, I know. You care about rugby league. I know people care about the, the commentary. We, we've got amazing commentators at Radio Merseyside, and it, it's it's the trust that you have of being placed in that chair. Someone has someone has said to me, "You're going to sit in that chair and you're going to present rugby league to X amount of people," and it's the trust that I feel like I need to relay as well with regards to that because I'm constantly you know 
I'm not saying every word I say has to be perfect, but at the same time, I, I want to re repay the faith that is that has been shown to me in terms of putting me in in, in that situation. One hundred percent, I I can echo that completely. In that, you can sense when somebody has faith or has trust in you, and has given you a foot up or an opportunity or opened the door for you to take an opportunity, and there is an obligation to them almost to deliver on that. I want to pick up on something that you said and almost spin the conversation a bit more in terms of the the technical aspect of football. You mentioned Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo there, and <laughs> I, I'm got I want to ask this to if if I ever bump into a a professional footballer who was a centre forward anytime soon, I'll put this this question to them: If you were a centre forward, would you rather have the midfield of Tony Cruz, Casemiro, and Luka Modric behind you, or Andres Iniesta, Sergio Busquets, and Xavi. Yeah, how can you how can you do that to me without prepping that? It's a good question. <laughs> it is. I mean, uh, uh, for me, Barcelona performance in two thousand eleven at Wembley against United. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure. I've seen a team performance like that. We. I, I know. I mentioned the Liverpool five 0 against Nottingham Forest in the eighties a couple of uh, a couple of minutes ago, but that's for that's for another gener that's for another generation to to say they watched that live. Watching that Barcelona display live that night, it, it was just just ridiculous. For me, if 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 I'm if I'm talking about. The best midfielders I've seen. I mean, all, all all six of them get in. But I was thinking to myself the other day in terms of where I'd put them in terms of best 11s and things like that. I mean, even when I was at Anfield the other week, watching Luka Modric play football at the age of 37, he redefined what I thought a central midfielder should do. 37. <laughs> it's just remarkable. But if, if you're a centre forward, ooh, that is a good question. I think, you know what? It's such a good question. I'm not even sure it, it, it's got an answer, okay. to be honest, because obviously you know, Casemiro and Busquets, they do the holding role. I think Busquets is a better passer of the ball than Casemiro, but I think Casemiro can provide more in terms of going forward. I think I think he's quite underrated in terms of that, that side of his game. It's like a aspect of his game, yeah. Um, but Xavi was just incredible. Iniesta is one of the best dribblers of a ball I've ever seen in my life. Modric, again, I say he redefined... What I think a centre midfielder should do, sort of going into their thirties, and Tony Kroos is one of my favourite players of all time. Um, but I think just because that Barcelona team of 2000, 2011, that 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 helped me fall in love with football. Yeah. I mean, I know I know I was around. Well, I've been around sixteen at the time, so I've been watching football for years. I had some amazing moments watching football, but that Barcelona team made me fall in love with it. And I, I, I just, I'm, I'm actually so grateful to. You know, you talk about being born in certain areas. I'm so grateful. I was, I was able to watch that live. Yeah, too. watch that whole team live, really. Yeah, too. I'm going to put a hypothesis forward, and you can disagree and pick it apart if you like. That as a centre forward, it would be preferable to play with the Barcelona trio, whereas as a defender it'd be preferable to play with the Real Madrid trio. Hmm. Oh, I have to say, I've always thought this, and this is, again, maybe a bit controversial. You can pick it apart if you want. Barcelona and Real Madrid, I've never looked at them and thought they were defensively amazing. Hmm. I mean, I, I know I know Barcelona have got a very good record in the league of this season, for example. But I've always thought, but then you look at them in the Europa League as well. Champions League in the Europa League um, uh, this season and how, how badly it went for them. I've always thought those two teams give you chances. Um, and it's funny because I've never looked at Barcelona and Real Madrid in terms of their defence. Because even the defenders, they get involved. I mean, Sergio Ramos's record is incredible. I remember there was a goal Gerard Piquet scored against Inter Milan in the early 2010s. Uh, it might have even been 2010. When he literally spun on it inside the six-yard box and finished it, it was just incredible. Dani Alves, Marcelo, uh, Jordi Alba, you know, 
and then you go back to Roberto Carlos, Kat, uh, um, you know, and, and all them. Like, even Cannavaro got involved. Um, I've never looked at them. I've never looked at either team defensively, and, and I'm particularly focused on that side of their game, Not to me. be honest. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I understand. The first thing that sprung to mind, I'm, I'm not so much asking for an analysis of the sides in terms of defensive, yeah. defensive unit, but a, a thought that come to mind was in, in terms of that Barcelona side. They're, whilst you don't think of them as a defensive unit off the ball, I would say their defence came from the fact that you never actually had the ball. No, I was literally about to say that. <laughs> you, can't, you can't attack a team if you never have the ball. <laughs> But one of the things I think Pep Guardiola said, particularly around that time, you know, the the, the 2010 onwards, what, one of the things they are famous for is their relentless pressing within the first five or so seconds in which they lose the ball to win it back, which may give them an edge. I don't know. I mean, again, you, I think just because it is so incredibly difficult to get the ball off Xavi and the Eston Busquets in their prime, um, that is so difficult. I mean, it, it makes me laugh to this day that Busquets gets the assist to to Messi's goal of the Bernabeu in the, in the Champions League semi final. Um, oh, no, I it the screen is because he screens it, doesn't he? And it's so smart that it is. He just says, he just says, go on, go on, Leo, you do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I I, I told because I feel like. The commentary to that goal is just playing in my head. One, two, three. Two, three, four. Well, I mean, yeah. Pete, you know, Peter Joy. I mean, if we talk about commentators, like, again, I think for a lot of people, Peter Jory, if they were to get, if they, if they were to give a voice of football around this, around this time of, you know, this era, I think Peter Jory has to yeah. be at least one of the goes uh, again. I love Clive Tilsley. He was you know, a big part of my childhood in terms of listening to, to his commentary. Peter Drury, as well. I think that those two of the last twenty or thirty years or so, they they've just been amazing. Um, and it's just it, it it's the it's the poeticness. Yeah, if that's a word <laughs> that they provide, it's glorious. It's the use of the English language, and 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 as we yeah. know, all the the com- the confined of. Of using the English language within within a sporting context, but like we were yeah. talking about before, I and I think I sent you the again. If I know we're talking about like the evolution of of digital media and stuff, that the TikTok and the captions that someone had made of Peter Drury's um, pre match monologue before France and Argentina walked out onto yeah. the uh, for the World Cup final just gone. In terms of he encapsulated how much the sport means to so many people yeah within the confines of such an event um which again i I say i think if you are to give anyone the voice of football award in this era and i think i don't even know if he has official um social media profiles no he he does i I remember during lockdown a lot of people were asking how he was and uh, he, he sent Jim Beglin because he's obviously a good friend to Jim Beglin uh, a video I think it was just after Norman Hunter died so he passed away um, and he said about his time working with Norman Hunter when he was a young broadcaster um, and it was just so eloquently put and again he knows, knows the right thing for the right time um, and again I, I think he leads useful life without social media to be honest with you um, but yeah I mean I, I was going to quickly say as well you know Little things that I listened to, and I just learned because he, he admitted that for one of his most glorious lines against uh, Roma and or for Roma against Barcelona. God, the header came. The header went in. <clears throat> Why he said the second line was because he didn't know who scored. So it was that the moment of composure to realise it was man last, and then he took it away after that. But um, yeah, yeah it just uh, one of the greats, and uh, uh, I would be. It would be an honour to to ever meet the man. Certainly, I, I could certainly echo that. Now, you, you talk about the performance of Luka Modric redefining your opinion on what a central midfielder should do at the age of 37. I want to ask, and I always find this an interesting question to ask anybody who, who has a passion and love for football in particular, what is the best goal that you've ever seen scored live? Because I feel like this also says a lot about what football appeals to people. What, well, 
tactical approach into style of football that appeals to different people? Mm. I've been forced to see some great goals. Um, I think the best... Uh, I, I, one one kind of sticks out. I mean, uh, there's, there's a few, but one sticks out in that um, Mohamed Salah's first against Roma in 2018 and that the connection of underside of the crossbar, back of the net. And when I look at it as well, I love post and stamp goals. Because sometimes you look and think, oh, could the keeper do a little bit better and things like that. And the man in goal for Roma that night was Alison Becker. <laughs> So, you know, obviously soon to be Mohamed Salah's teammate, but the ball was just perfect. It was Salah at the peak of his powers, curling into the top corner. Um, generally, I mean, I, I have seen some great goals. Um, it, it, it's, it's difficult. It's a bit like, what's your favourite movie? And I'm sad here now. <laughs> and I'm trying to think of, of goals that I've seen off the, off the top of my head. But, I mean, I've I've seen, like, Amazing goals lower down. Yeah. So I've seen a goal. I've seen a goalkeeper score a twenty-yard volley in the in the northern Pre- in the northern Premier League or West Division against Marine at Rossett Park. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that, that's the that's the whole level. Because one thing you, one thing you noticed as well. I mean, if you watch the EFL highlight show, you realize how many screamers get scored every weekend, but they don't make it to certain levels of social media because they're not some of the highest profile names in the game but there's so much talent up and down the, the EFL and, and I love it I'm, I mean I'll, right, right, now, right now I'm just trying to think of other other potential goals that um, that I've seen live but um, Suarez. I love, I love, love, Suarez. love a good team goal for example yeah yeah Go on, Suarez I was going to say the, the Suarez did he score three or four against oh god he scored so many against Norwich he scored, he scored four he scored four against Norwich I wasn't there uh, on that night, but that was if you if you can score, if you can score four better go- if you can score four better goals in one game than that. Yeah, you'd be hard pressed to find any. Even 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 the one, even the one from the corner, I we don't think gets as much credit as it does. It's a bouncing ball. It's close range. The amount of times we've seen that skied, just because his others were long range worldies. Um, but again, it, you know, the, the the technicality of the man um, was, in was their, just in their, glorious. In their prime, you've got to start one and bench one, Salah or Suarez. Ooh, ooh, that is a tremendous question because I was I was thinking kind of if you know keep sell bench Benzema Lewandowski. And Suarez, and then that is, that is a proper talk. Um, I mean, they, they obviously play different roles, don't they? Salah was more of a wide forward, kind of cuts inside. Suarez was always through the centre. Um, I think one thing you say about Suarez was that Liverpool 2013 and 14 doesn't happen without him. Yeah, that's right. He was that good. Um, and you, that, 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 that season, he missed five games, missed the first five games. Um, came back in against Sunderland, scored two on his return. It was like he'd never been away. Um, and that was just the the unquestionable quality of Luis Suarez. For all you could say about the controversies, um, the, the the quality of the man was has never been in, has never been in debate. Um, and even when he went to Atletico after how sourly it ended up at Barcelona, he went and won La Liga with with, with Atletico Madrid. So. I think I was thinking about we could call the third best football of the decade. I think a lot of people will maybe say maybe side with Neymar, but I think Suarez have a very big say in that. Hmm. Interesting. Ne- Neymar was is one of those that was born in the, the wrong generation, wasn't he? Because I think if if he was born outside of the Messi and Ronaldo dominance, then I think we probably he'd have a Ballon d'Or to his name. Yeah, yeah, we we <laughs> we'd look at him almost as, as the you know. That, the the poster boy of Brazilian football almost, you know. Yeah, I mean, to be, I I think he has had that tag anyway. Um, but I think I think now he said he wants to hand that number ten shirt to Vinicius Junior. And I think Vinicius Junior. I mean, I've seen the, I've seen having seen the man live. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow! He's terrifying, yeah. terrifyingly quick. Just so, I mean. 
I haven't seen a goal scored against Liverpool at Anfield. A first goal. As good as good as that first one. And I know people look at maybe the defending for it. Finish. I'm on the I'm on the end of the stadium and I'm like, wow, okay, that, that that's good. I just I just turned to my cousin and went, he's good, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> it's not what you can do in those situations. No. Like yeah, like I I I can look up there's been time for that been a good listen. Um Trying to recall what score they beat us, but we got beat by Tottenham, where Christian Eriksen caught the ball on a on a, on a half volley, I think it was, outside the the eighteen yard box. But you know when somebody catches it with the technique, where he just I remember the goal you're talking about, yeah. He struck it so sweetly that the trajectory of, of the ball is just perfect; it doesn't change. It it's too hard for the keeper to get to. Um, that springs to mind. But another one is the Yuri Tielman's one from not too long ago, which. Okay. Oh, the, 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 the volley before the World Cup. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's yeah. what got a propensity towards volleyed, volley goals, I think. There's... Oh, he, you know, he's, he's a wonderful technician as well, Yuri Tielemans. It reminds me as well, uh, you just mentioned the Ericsson one, the Thiago one against Porto last year, where I still can't decide if the ball touched the ground or not. Easy cutter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I, I do love, I mean, say, for example, one, one thing I've stopped, I mean, because the, the, you talk about social media and kind of linking that into live play as well. I mean, when when I, when I go to football matches, I'm never on my phone yeah. because I'm, I'm there. I pay to watch football. No, t- but, no, no TikToks, no. No, 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 no. You know, even half time. I mean, not half times probably because you got you can't get four G. But one thing I've started doing a lot more. Um, I mean, I always love watching football, but sport in general when. I'm watching it now. I'll I'll put my phone to one side because I don't want to react to things. I don't want to hear. I don't want to be looking at the screen as the commentators' voices chirp up or anything like that. Because, for example, I love you know, team goals. Love team goals. But I like, say for example, you. It's almost it's like a one four seven in snooker. Snooker fan, you can tell when a one four seven is kind of emerging. You don't want to go on your phone because you want to see every ball get hit and it gets slotted. And it's absolutely perfect. I want to if I if I see a proper team goal, I want to see it from per, from first pass to last. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's why I just don't. I, I like like don't like missing anything. But uh, I think it's, um, I think it's there's nothing wrong with going on my phone, of course, during the game. But uh, I I just like to kind of keep trained on on the on the action. That goes back to comes full circle to what we were talking about earlier though it's almost like different generations have normalized different behaviors in different environments whereas we who would never dream bloody hell mate you, you won't even catch me take a selfie never mind film myself <laughs> what, was the, what was the last selfie I, uh, mind you no I, I took a few i took a few selfies when i was getting ready to present yeah, but that's, that's, look, look. that's all part of pushing the show in it. That's Mark's yeah. one. But uh, <laughs> no, I get like face for radio. <laughs> it is though, so, like yeah. I don't know. You don't catch many of them in the Glazer Street, like when I go. But and um, I guess that what people treating the, the saying, I've got to, I've got to be honest. I think I, I don't know. I don't. If, I'd be lying if I said it was if it wasn't entirely. But my enjoyment of going to games of football has changed drastically. Obviously, I've, I've been more games at Goodison Park than, than any other stadium. Um, watched Everton more than any other team, and so it's just sort of seen the decline. Not only that, but the 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 uh, the match going experience in terms of the atmosphere and the mentality of the crowd has changed a hell of a lot as well. Um. Which often leads me to like, for example, I remember being at Salford City against Peterborough United in the FA Cup not too long ago, and the <laughs> the referee given a bad decision, and I heard like a group of got to be anywhere between the ages of seven and ten telling the referee to fuck off, and there was just like some part in some part of my heart. Yeah. Kind of got water. No, that like it made me feel warm and happy inside. And, uh, <laughs> are still people at football games like that that like sort of take it at a face value as opposed to documenting every single moment on the phone, like reacting purely to to games of football. Yeah, and, yeah. 
hope hopefully it won't become too digitized and too sort of you know. I think I think everyone at some point who access to a digital phone has filmed the penalty at some point. Yeah. I've definitely filmed the penalty, but I think I, I know what you mean in terms of not like living on your phone because I mean we see the odd tweet, don't we? No no phones just living in the moment. Um and that, that that's a beautiful thing to to live by. I mean, I think it's it's it's. I know me and you we we like our music as well, and I think there's a there's a line that goes into a song, isn't it? You you don't realize you, uh, was it? You don't realize memory until you're in the moment, and and, and things like that. So, you know that that's why again going back to spawn, how much it means to people. Um, I think, uh, people will love, you know love sport for the moments that they enjoy, not the amount of selfies they have as well. Um, but yeah, obviously sport, you know, people can go about their own ways. Um, you know, I'll never tell people to stop taking <laughs> amount of selfies, but um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's just the way you go about it and how, how, how you enjoy it. I, I agree 100% with what you've just said, mate. And I think whilst I, I, it, it seems weird, this is only our first, podcast recording because i feel like we've had so many similar conversations in the past that it's funny that this is like the first one that's been recorded um <laughs> I, I do say this to guests in in that like who are finding like interesting that i'd love to have them back on the podcast but i know in fact that you'll be back on the podcast and we'll have more conversations like this in terms of oh, yeah. different Book me in. topical matters and, and, and subjects not just in football but in sports and, and life in general but i feel like that is an excellent place to, to wrap it up in that we are we're we're a weird uh i think we're a weird generation in that we're not we're not quite the the iphone generation we're we're, we were raised by the older generation with those values and beliefs around sport and around the match going experience but we've grown up accepting and understanding and tolerance of those with beliefs different to ourselves would you agree yeah yeah i mean i remember when the Super League was being talked about and as Real Madrid said along the lines of like you know, 16 to 24 year olds um, don't enjoy football in the same way and I couldn't disagree more to be honest um, I mean that, that was one point where that that few days I think was the most active I've been over social media for a while just because it, 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 the whole idea of the Super League infuriated me because and th- this might sound crazy to, to people listening of a certain opinion of a certain generation, as we're, as we're talking about. But, um, you know, if you offer me a guarantee of Liverpool playing every season, which comes out, Liverpool play the Roman in the last three seasons. But if you offer me Liverpool playing Roman in every single season, or Liverpool playing Burnley every season, I'm genuinely taking Burnley because the Real Madrid games, you have to earn them, and that 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 that's the that's the way I that's the way I viewed it. And I think one two people came back to me on Twitter about that, but that that that's how I viewed it because you have to earn those special nights. And you know, domestic games against domestic teams, and this that's no disrespect to Burnley, by the way, no disrespect to Burnley at all. Uh, but obviously, always. yeah, <laughs> gonna get the Twitter clarity after me. Um, <laughs> Like you know, in your own country, brilliant. I I have no desire to see Liverpool join the Super League ever, 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 ever. But games like Barcelona, the four 0 etc. You got to earn those nights, and that's that's why for me, um, you know, football won't ever get lost on people because you know even like away days and and, and things like that, you know. With growing up with your mates, etc., and learning about football that kind of way, I think it's so important to learn the authentic side of football and not just the football that's on TV as well. Yes, sir. Motive of the podcast: everything is earned, not given. Indeed, indeed. <laughs>